Hello, good morning, everybody. It is my great honor and pleasure to introduce Arthur Konrad Eckert. Uh, he is a fellow of the Royal Society and a professor at the Mathematical Institute of the University of Oxford. This is where we met like a quarter of a century ago when I was a student and uh, he was the president of the Polish Society. And um, I remember these jolly good times very well, but then you were at the physics department. Do I remember correctly? That's right, yes. Yeah, yes. Right. Uh, but also he is a fellow of the Singapore National Academy of Science and a professor at the University of Singapore and the founding director of the Center for Quantum Topologies. Did I get it right? Yes, yes, that's right. Okay. Uh, he is uh, known very well as a pioneer of quantum cryptography. He is a recipient of many prestigious awards and very remarkably, Arthur, please correct me if I'm wrong. In 2019, you were nominated for the Nobel Prize in Physics, right? Well, I, I couldn't possibly comment on that. <laughs> okay. <laughs> That's what I found on the internet. Anyway, this is truly remarkable. Uh, uh, Arthur has uh, a really good talent for uh, presenting and explaining science. So without any further ado, I will leave you with a pioneer of quantum cryptography. Arthur, the floor is yours. Take it away. Well, thank you. And um, well, good morning to all of uh, you in, in, in Poland. And I understand that we have some, uh, some joining us uh, via internet from other places in the world. So whatever time zone is, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to all of you. Um, and so thank you very much uh, for your kind invitation to present uh, this brief uh, intro to quantum crypto. It's going to be, um, you know, it's, it's kind of difficult to, to pitch it right because some of you may be interested in mathematical details. Some of you might be interested in a general outline of the field. So I tried a little bit of both and let's see how it goes, okay? Um, so let me start with uh, sharing the screen. That's the, we try that, so that's the first hurdle. So here we go. Can you see the screen, by the way? Yes. Okay. Clear. Uh, I just try to. Uh, I'll try to navigate through this. Okay. So the <clears throat> so basically the outline of this talk is is first to just give you some kind of a historical perspective on the on the big question: Is there a perfect cipher? Is there a perfect method that we can communicate with with uh, with a pretty good or perfect security. Then I'm going to identify the key ingredient for that. That's that's called the uh, cryptographic key and and the whole shebang of the key distribution, and which is like the holy grail of cryptography. Then I will, you know, then unexpectedly, right? So so this was a big surprise that you have physics entering this field. What used to be really a piece of mathematics, I would say. Um, or engineering or computer science. So it, it was a, a bit surprising that quantum physics uh, came to the rescue here. But nonetheless, uh, there is a good narrative about it. So I'll try to explain why and, and why it makes sense. And then at the end of the talk, I will go a little bit uh, ballistic and maybe I'll just talk about some half-baked ideas about uh, foundations of quantum physics and how they relate to security. Um, so I understand that you have probably mostly mathematical background. So I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go into all technical details, but I will try to identify topics that if you are interested, you should just uh, explore further and just looking them up on the internet. So there will be a slide every now and then saying your homework, go and look it up on the internet, okay? So let's start with a bit of a historical introduction to the whole field of uh, secure communication. So when we go back in time, so to ancient Greeks and ancient Romans, you know, in Europe, it's always the case that uh, whenever we want to start our narrative with some kind of a historical background, so ancient Greeks or ancient Romans always appear first. And it's probably slightly different in China or in India. But nonetheless, for crypto, it's certainly the European uh, uh, it has a pretty much European origin, so probably related with the fact that uh, uh, Phoenicians discovered an alphabet and uh, it was very easy to play with a final set of symbols. So you have finite 
number of letters in the alphabet. So you can permute them um, just to scramble the message, or you can substitute one letter for another. And both techniques essentially were used. Um, so the first one was uh, the permutation was used by ancient Greeks, the Spartans, uh, about 400 BC. Um, so what they did is, is uh, actually it's probably the first device that uh, was uh, used to implement permutation of characters. So the way it works is, is imagine that you have a, a wooden button of a certain diameter and you write your mess uh, and, and then you have a parchment, so a strip of parchment, which you rub around this wooden button. And then you write your message like you know, attack tomorrow, for example. Then you would unwrap it and uh, you would give it to a courier who would carry this parchment. When you see, when you unwrap it, you can see it at the bottom here, uh, the letters are, you know, modulo the rotation by 90 degrees, but they, the, the, the position of the letters is changed now. So you give it to a, <clears throat> to a courier that takes it to another military commander in nation Sparta. And then the other guy will have a wooden button of the same diameter. So the guy would just take this, parchment, wrap it around the wooden button, and the message would reappear. So that was the first uh, device that we know about that was used for crypto purposes and, and also some a very simple device that implemented permutation of characters. It's called Skittily, all back to Asian Sparta. Then uh, we have Julius Caesar, about 50 BC, who is uh, allegedly, he used the uh, you know, as long as we were to trust historians. Um, so allegedly he um, implemented uh, and used uh, a very simple substitution cipher. So you take uh, the whole alphabet, A, B, C, D, all the way to Z, the Roman alphabet, and you shift the whole string to, um, well, to the left. So as you can see here, A, B, C sticks out and you take it and append it at the end of the alphabet. And then you have a very simple substitution rule, which says for A, substitute D, for B, substitute E, for C, F, for D, G, and so on and so forth. So you use this rule and uh, take the same message, attack tomorrow, and you have what you have. You have a very simple substitution rule, which gives you the encrypted text. Apparently, Caesar looked, uh, used it with some, some success. Um, now, it took uh, people, uh, well, you know, it's just from the from from the modern perspective, it's a very very simple way of an encryption, especially if you use only the shifts in the alphabet. You can, of course, you can you can figure out a more general substitution rule and the number of possible substitutions. Uh, if you have uh, you know, a substantial number of uh, like thirty something letters in the alphabet, it will be enormous. So the the number of uh, one-to-one -one substitutions would be huge, but it's very, very easy to break this kind of ciphers. And um, again, uh, historians tell us that the first person who came with a systematic method of breaking that kind of ciphers was uh, uh, a person called Al-Kindi that is known as the philosophers of the Arab. He lived in uh, 800 AD, what is today Baghdad, essentially. And um, so he figured out that in any natural language, the letters do not appear randomly. So there is a, a pattern for every single natural language. There is a statistical pattern for the letters and for the pairs of letters, triplets of letters, and so on and so forth. So the English, for example, if you write in English, then you'll find the most frequent letter um, to be the letter E and uh, you know, TH appears quite frequently and so on and so forth. So I, so well, most in the European languages, in, in fact, have very similar distribution of um, frequency of characters, but here is the one for Polish. Um, so you can see letter A is dominant. And, uh, and the, you know, the rule to, to crack this, what is called one-to-one uh, -one substitution or monoalphabetic solvers is very simple. You look for the most frequent character, right? And if your message was written in English, then you assume it's the letter E. And if it was written in Polish, then you say it's the letter A, most likely. Then you try it. So it's a try and error formula. And sooner or later, you can actually figure out how um, what the message is. Except, you know, that there are some writers who um, just take it as a challenge to um, to beat the natural frequency of characters even <laughs> in a given language. I find it actually amusing. So there is a whole genre in literature called lipograms. 
where uh, you on purpose avoid a particular letter. And uh, a big challenge is to write in French or in English without the letter E, which is the most frequent letter in, in the, uh, both in French and English. Um, and probably the most famous uh, lipogram was written by, uh, by a French guy, Gilbert Adair, who wrote a book, uh, actually a novel, and quite a substantial actually, um, and he avoided the letter E. And the funny thing is, you know, it was translated, sorry, I, did this, um, I messed it up. The, the name of the, the French guy was Georges Perec. Uh, but, uh, but what happened was that this book was translated by Gilbert Adair, to English, which and the uh, and uh, the the translator was so clever that he managed to avoid the letter E as well. I was um, looking for a Polish lipogram, and probably the the best, uh, well, at least the one that I could find was by uh, the Polish uh, poet and novelist uh, Julian Tuvim. Um, that. Uh, so he managed to write, uh, 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 you know, without you know a substantial piece of text uh, without the letter R. It's it reads you know when you read it in Polish, right? It reads weird, but kind of okay. It it, it makes sense. It's, it's not completely um, uh, artificial. So yeah, it's an art. Try it, right? So if you're Polish, try to write something without the letter A. Good luck with that. <laughs> um, so anyway, so the, the thing is that those one-to-one um, -one or monoalphabetic ciphers were very easy to break. So people realized that, of course, uh, not only Alkindi, but many other people. And uh, people started looking for more clever ways to encrypt uh, messages. So here we come to mostly a, a Renaissance period in, in, in the European history, and uh, we have a few remarkable characters. And uh, here, and let's, uh, so I think probably one of them that uh, made the most significant contribution was uh, Leone Battista Alberti. You probably know Alberti as a skillful and accomplished architect. Um, he was a Renaissance man. He tried just about everything. So in the 15th century, he came up with the uh, idea that uh, why should we use just one substitution? Well, why don't we just superimpose few substitutions? So he came up with the idea of saying, okay, let's use three or more substitutions. For the first letter in the text, in the message, use one substitution rule. For the second, use another substitution rule. For the third, yet another substitution rule. And for the Fourth, maybe you come to the first substitution rule and so on and so forth. So for example, um, if you take the Caesar cipher, right, where you shifted the whole alphabet by a certain number of characters, right? Caesar did it by three, but you can shift it by any other. So imagine a sequence of shifts, for example, by seven, by 14, by 19, and you repeat seven, 14, 19, which means the first letter you encrypt with a Caesar cipher where you shift the alphabet by seven. The second letter you encrypt with a Caesar cipher, but then you ship the alphabet by 14 letters. And uh, the third letter you encrypt with a Caesar cipher with a shift in 19. You go to the fourth letter and you repeat the sequence. So you shift with seven, the fifth by the 14th and uh, the sixth by 19 and so on and so forth. So, you know, this has a, a nice feature, for example, that Whatever you have in the plain text, that in the message, for take, take the message, for example, which reads cell, you have two letters, L and L at the end. And with a monoalphabetic cipher, they are mapped exactly to the same character in the cryptogram. But in this case, uh, the first letter will be encrypted by, the first L will be encrypted by the shift uh, of 19th and the uh, the second L will be encrypted by the shift um, by seven. So, so you know they are mapped into different uh, characters in the cryptogram. So that was uh, that was there was certainly a progress in terms of uh, making those things more difficult. Uh, and to be honest, Alberti is not the only one who is credited with this invention. There's a Johannes Trehemius, the German guy, there's De Vignier from France, probably a few others who came up with. Um, and this method uh, independently, but 
But Alberti, being um, uh, an architect, an engineer, a person who liked to play with devices, came up with a, a mechanical device so that, that introduced, that implemented substitution that was called as Alberti encryption disk. So you have uh, two concentric disks and on the parameter of the each, uh, you can, you, you write the alphabet and you simply rotate one with respect to the other and that gives you the substitution rule. So that was very easy to you using this encryption disk uh, to implement uh, those substitutions by different shifts by you know, shifting by say 7, 14, 19, like in our example. Um, then it took people a while to break polyalphabetic ciphers because they come in all kinds of different uh, disguise. So there were many polyalphabetic ciphers and uh, uh, implementation of this basic idea varied enormously. Uh, again, the person who probably was the first to, to, to break polyalphabetic ciphers was Charles Babbage, the same Babbage who, who was responsible for designing the first uh, computing devices, programmable computing devices. So that, that happened you know, by the um, 8th, 9th, 8th, 18th, early 19th century. So it took a while to find a method for breaking polyalphabetic ciphers. So it's just all kudos goes to Babbage. So Babbage, I'm not going to tell you how he did it, but essentially the, the whole point was to figure out what is the length of uh, this key which is, I mean, the number of substitutions, for example, that you use. Here we have a cycle of three. So once you figure this out, then you can just, uh, you know that every third character is encrypted with the same monoalphabetic cipher. And then you start breaking, um, you look at every third character and, and apply Alkindi method of statistical analysis. So that's roughly how it works. So, but the key point was actually to figure out how many substitutions you, you use. And there are methods for that. Now this Alberti disk, um, became a, um, a, a prototype for more complicated devices, um, um, especially a rotor so that, uh, when when people started making more complicated devices in in the in the early 20th century for encryption, uh, they used um, machines that uh, had not just one Alberti disk but made many of them. And uh, those uh, rotor machines were actually quite clever. And probably, you know, again, from the Polish perspective, but not only Polish perspective, I would say, uh, the Enigma machine inverted by a Dutch guy, Arthur Scherbius, uh, or Scherbius, I really don't know how to pronounce his surname, but, uh, but uh, he is the one who came up with this, uh, uh, what was considered at the time, uh, so sophisticated rotor machine that uh, implemented a, a very complex polyalphabetic cipher. But even that one was not uh, perfect in a sense that uh, the ingenious uh, Polish mathematician Marian Rejewski and his colleagues uh, managed to, to crack it using all kinds of interesting uh, techniques from the using group of permutations, blah, blah, blah. Again, wonderful story, wonderful narrative, great contribution of the Polish uh, crypto cryptologist to, um, to the history of cryptography. Zygalski, Ruzicki, Rajewski, and, and all kuda also to the bosses who work in this Polish Bureau of Ciphers at the time, who, who kind of understood the value of mathematics and, and this approach. Not that they trusted completely. The, I mean, the story is that for a while, the Polish intelligence also had another source that was verifying the decryptions uh, made by, by this trio. But nonetheless, um, you know, the, the story here is that uh, you come with a clever device and then there's someone else who is even more clever and can break this encryption. So the question is, is there a perfect cipher, right? So we saw Skittily, easy to break, Alberti disk, okay, polyalphabetic cipher is quite complex, complicated, but nonetheless, sooner or later you break them, right? And then, uh, and then comes Enigma and then you break it and a few other things and you break them. So is this going to be like this vicious circle all the time that whenever we come with some ideas um, uh, for good encryption, there will be people who will just find a way to decrypt it? Is it a cat and mouse game all the time? Well, um, for long people said, yes, it is. But now we say, well, probably it isn't because it seems that the code makers have an upper hand in this game.
So if there is one one uh, thing that uh, people uh, cryptographers agree is that there is a perfect cipher, a cipher that you cannot break, uh, and it's called one time path. And the way it works is uh, rather simple. You have a message which you write as a sequence of zeros and ones, um, and uh, you have a random string of zeros and ones of the same length as the message. And then what you do, you add the key to the message or the message to the key using binary addition one by one. So, so essentially when you uh, add uh, two binary numbers, so it goes like you know, zero plus zero is zero, one plus zero is one, zero plus one is one, but one plus one is equal to zero. So, so you get another sequence of zeros and ones. Now, um, it's assumed that if the message itself, so if you if you if you look at the sequence of zeros and ones that is uh, that represent the message, um, it is known what kind of binary alphabet was used to represent this message. That could be an ASCII code, for example. So there is a statistical pattern of a natural language there, which you can easily break uh, using simple statistical analysis, or you simply know the code because it's in public domain that was that was used to represent the message so that's that's just you know representing the message in, in terms of zeros and ones and nothing more uh, to it but but then when you add it to the key the key is really a random sequence of zeros and ones uh, picked up with a uniform distribution from all possible binary strings of that length so so then this randomness through the process of addition binary addition transfers to the cryptogram so if you look at the cryptogram it just simply the random key wipes out any statistical pattern that you may see in the message. So it's completely random. So now the story is, okay, imagine Alice and Bob, our two good guys who are going to communicate secretly. And um, Alice has a secret key, Bob has a secret key, identical and secret. So they are known only to Alice and Bob. So Alice will just write the message, use the key, produce the cryptogram, sends the cryptogram over any open and protected channel to Bob. Bob takes the cryptogram, picks up the key from a secret drawer, of course, and um, does essentially the same operation, binary addition, and recovers the message. And uh, it, Claude Shannon, who was the founding father of information theory, who also um, in, in, in cryptography, actually managed to show that if the key is as long as the message, if it is uh, truly secret, truly random, and never reused, then uh, you cannot break this system because there's no statistical pattern uh, in the cryptogram. Uh, so that is a perfect cipher, right? So this is exactly the perfect cipher. And uh, so, you know, that would be the end of my story <laughs> if it were really the case that... Uh, we can use it without any problems. The problem is, though, that we cannot because, uh, well, we can under this uh, assumption that Alice and Bob uh, can generate enough keys to communicate simply because the key is quickly used, right? As soon as you use the key, um, you cannot reuse the same key. If you do, and uh, there are stories in the past where uh, for example, the Soviets did uh, this um, uh, shortly after World War II, and uh, they 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 were using the one-time path for a certain type of communication, and then they they found it dif difficult to distribute the keys, new keys, to uh, people in the field, and essentially they had to reuse the keys. And the Americans had a special program uh, that looked at those cases and. Uh, and uh, managed to break many of those, the so-called one-time path encryptions, simply because they were not implemented according to the rules. So it's very important that uh, you uh, follow the, the rules. You don't use or you don't reuse the key. But if you follow those rules, of course, it is perfectly secret unless you can provide Alice and Bob, unless Alice and Bob can find a way to establish a completely random, meaningless sequence of zeros and ones uh that is uh, known only to them it's random and it's secret and this is known as the key distribution problem because if alice and bob are miles away from each other how how shall they do it they have to use a super secure communication channel for that because the the security 
of the subsequent communication really depends on on the secrecy of the key. So that's 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 very important here. So this key distribution problem became the problem in crypto when, uh, especially in the in the um, 60s and 70s when people were the not so much in the military but in the in the commercial sector the, the number of encrypted messages increased and even though people people wouldn't be using the extreme case of the of the uh, polyalphabetic cipher which is a one-time path but even a polyalphabetic ciphers of um, industrial standards for cryptographic commission required key distribution the key distribution was a problem so the the, the bottom line is find the key distribution solve the key distribution problem and uh, and then you have a perfect cipher combine it with one time pad and you have a perfect cipher so the the quest so so where we are now okay so the quest for perfect security brought us to this point where we have one time pad but we have the key distribution problem and there are two ways of solving it the first one uh, which goes to, which is a very beautiful mathematical solution uh, goes to uh, goes back to 1970s and is known as a public key systems so it's based on uh, mathematical problems which are uh, so it's based on what is known as a computational complexity i'm not going to talk much about it but essentially it's about uh, basing uh, you, you base your your secret on you, you don't have the the need for the key distribution you have two keys one is public one is private and you encrypt messages with a public key uh, decrypt with a private key and uh, the the question is knowing the public key that everyone knows can you um, figure out the private key and the answer is yes as long as you can solve some difficult problems like factoring problems related to elliptic curves and so on and so forth the, the the big issue with this public key crypto systems is that usually we cannot prove for sure that they are secure because we don't know whether certain problems will always remain difficult and uh, a good ex and, and we even know that some problems that are perceived to be difficult are not really difficult especially when you build a new generation of devices say like quantum computers then many of those public key systems like RSA and elliptics will not be secure so the big thing now is sorry Arthur uh, what is RSA sorry rsa what is it rsa is just a, a public key crypto system rsa stands for reversed charmier and edelman the three inventors of this and the security of rsa is based on factoring um so that's the most popular public key crypto system that is uh, that is used for uh, for encryption the but we know that RSA that is based on the difficulty that is difficult to factor large integers is not secure because uh, we have quantum algorithms for that. Not that we can implement them now because we don't have we don't have quantum computers, but uh, in principle we can. So there is a big concern in government agencies uh, that in a few years' time, I don't know, maybe in ten, in twenty, fifty, who knows, when we have. Uh, quantum computers that are capable of breaking RSA or those uh, crypto systems based on elliptic curves, then we will um, uh, we will be in trouble, right? So there is a need to come up with uh, another cryptographic standards. So that is based on mathematical problems, which are difficult even for quantum computers. And, uh, and then uh, there are some proposals. In fact, the National Security Agency, um, together with the National Institutes of Standards and Technology in the United States, um, announced an open call for proposals for the new standards. And uh, about a month ago or so, they announced the winners. Um, so what will be the next standard in, in public key crypto system? Hopefully the, the one that cannot uh, that can withstand attack from the future quantum computers. But even that is a little bit problematic. I say a few words about it in a moment. The other approach is, is uh, just to fix the key distribution problem using quantum phenomena. And I'm going to talk about uh, this in a moment. But coming back very, oh yeah, so just for your homeworks, this will appear uh, 
<laughs> so funny you ask this question because I want to, to give you homework. So, so there are certain things I will just uh, only mention very briefly, but I will not go into detail. So those who are knowledge hungry and want to know details, uh, I will, I'll just simply ask you to look it up on the internet. It's, it's very easy these days. So one thing that, you know, you will see this accumulated uh, list of topics that you have to look up as your homework. So one is a public key crypto systems. I haven't explained to you how they work, but uh, it's a beautiful piece of mathematics based on various interesting mathematical problems, mostly number theory based, but uh, look up public key crypto system, RSA, elliptic curves and lattice base. So those lattice base are actually used for this quantum immune or post quantum crypto as it's called. And, you know, to be honest, the even though the um, the um, the winners of this NIST competition were announced, few, actually two or three, at least two, uh, crypto systems that were proposed that were shortlisted and and you know a short shortlisted I would say at the very last stage were broken in a rather spectacular ways. And we are talking about the development from the last few weeks, in fact. Uh, so one of them was just, uh, it, it's kind of embarrassing, right? Because you have this serious agency and says, okay, we are looking about quantum, uh, we are looking about, we are looking at systems that should be so strong that even if you have a quantum computer, you cannot break it. And then, you know, you just have a, a guy who takes one of the candidates and uh, and breaks it within a weekend on his laptop. So it's uh, so that 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 undermines the the trust in the final selection. So hopefully they 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 will last for a while. But how long will will those things be secure? I don't know. So it's just uh, so this is for you. Um, young brave mathematicians here's a challenge you know pick up any of those um that are on the short list of uh, NIST and try to break it this is exactly the spirit right so that's exactly why nsa wants to have a public call you don't want to develop those things behind closed doors simply because you may not uh, you may miss something and if you have the whole world working for you trying to break those systems and that's great because essentially um, you expose them to um, a real test. So um, anyway, so this is not what I want to talk about. So let's let's um, let's talk about quantum crypto. The quantum crypto is uh, so we remember now we want to fix the problem. We want to just find a way uh, to distribute this random key. And uh, the the you know the best challenge is to be to know that it is secret that is not only known only to Alice and Bob, and here the classical mathematics you don't have even you don't have to go quantum that much. The classical mathematics is actually um, very helpful because we have tools, mathematical tools, uh, that uh, essentially allow Alice and Bob and a possible third character an eavesdropper to to actually come to a situation where Eve knows very little about the key that is shared by Alice and Bob. Usually this, the situation is that Alice and Bob distribute the key using a method. So at the moment, let's forget about how they did it. So suppose they did it, right? And suppose there was an eavesdropper who, who was uh, trying to intercept uh, this key distribution process. So there are two things that Alice and Bob can do, and those are classical um, uh, protocols. So one of them is just um, if there are any errors between, uh, so if, if the two binary strings are, that Alice and Bob have are not identical, that can be fixed by public error correction. So that's, that's you know, if, if they, I mean, they're completely different, it cannot be fixed, but they, if there are some errors, and there are not too many errors, that, that can be sorted out. Um, but then um, in this process, but also in the process of eavesdropping, an eavesdropper, Eve may acquire some information about the key. It may not be perfect, it may be partial. So Eve may know some binary bits, but may not know others. So we actually, the, the security of uh, this binary string X here uh, can be understood as a situation where Eve can guess the key correctly with probability one over two to the n, where n is the 
the length of the key or very close to one over two to the n, right? So it's just a completely random guess. So that means she has no information whatsoever about the key. So that's what ideally, that's what we would like to achieve. And there's a way of doing this and it's called, it's called uh, privacy amplification. The basic idea, just to give you a flavor of it. So suppose, uh, which I have to say, it's, it's, it's a very simplistic and it only works in some cases. So this basic idea goes like this. So suppose Eve knows one of two bits uh, that uh, Alice and Bob share, but Alice and Bob don't know which one. So there are two bits called it X1 and X2, zeros and ones. We know that Alice knows either X1 or X2, just for example. Um, can we do something about it? Um, so Alice and Bob, then what they can do, they can, there's a very simple trick. They can simply add uh, the two bits together. So then they get only one bit Z, which is a, a binary addition of X1 and X2, but they know that the Z is secure, right? Because they know only one is known to Alice, sorry, well, only one of the two bits is known to Eve, but the other one is completely unknown. So Eve has no idea about whether the other one is zero or one. By adding that together, the randomness, so to speak, from the Eve's perspective of this one bit is transferred to Z. So Z is completely unknown to her. So what we did here, Alice and Bob in public applied a certain protocol to the binary strings, and then they reduced the key from two bits to one bit, but they know now that this one bit is, is secure. But the, the, the essential idea is that in order to use this protocol, they have to know how much an eavesdropper Eve knows. So then again, so we are switching a little, the, there's a little bit of mathematics, but there is a, a, there is a whole area of privacy amplification based on randomness extractors, where first, as first you estimate, so as long as you can estimate how much an eavesdropper, any eavesdropper may know about a shared secret. Uh, so you, the, the, the figure of merit here is the min entropy, uh, which is like my, which is minus log of the probability of an eavesdropper guessing the key correctly. So then there is a, a procedure and randomness instructor that allows you to distill a secret key uh, with uh, which is uh, of length L, which is sort of shorter. Um, it's upper bounded by this min entropy. Now, um, so that's again, the, I mean, you don't have to pay too much attention to this, but those are interested, I, I can only mention that this goes like this. There's a raw key. You estimate uh, the Eve's uncertainty in terms of the min entropy, that is this green bar and the red bar here represents Eve's knowledge about the key. So, so intuitively, it makes sense to see that, I mean, you can probably see your intuition will be right, that you cannot distill more than Eve's uncertainty about the key. So the, the maximum length of the key should be equal to this H mean entropy. But then if you want to make it even more secure, you make it even shorter. And uh, so that extra reduction of the key in length will actually improve the security of the key in terms of the trace distance. So I use all kinds of words. So, so here is, uh, yeah, I'm adding to your homework, okay? Um, so you have to just, uh, if you want to understand it better or to those of you who want to go into detail. So you have to look up randomness extractors and privacy amplification. Then a good question to check is why cryptographers use min entropy rather than Shannon entropy. I will not tell you, you look it up. There's actually a simple answer that you have to look it up. And then, uh, you know, I define security as the probability of guessing is as good as a random guess, but it can be quantified in terms of something that is called in classical probability called Mogorov distance between probability distributions and quantum version of it is known as a trace distance. So you have to look at that. Now, okay, so the big thing now is reduced to finding how much Eve knows. And this is actually where you're completely stuck. So you know that as long as you know this number, how much the rest out there knows about the, 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 the shirt binary strings between Alice and Bob, there is a mathematical procedure based on privacy amplification. They will take you from there and possibly will generate a shorter key, but the key that will be secure. But how do you get this figure of merit? How do you get this 
mean entropy condition on E, right? So the mean entropy, the uncertainty about X from Eve's perspective. There's no answer to this question in classical domain. There's no protocol uh, which will actually tell you how to do that because we never know what kind of tricks uh, an eavesdropper may use to intercept or to eavesdrop on, on the communication between Alice and Bob. So here comes quantum. So it turns, that, it turns out that quantum phenomena are very sensitive to things such as someone is looking at something. You know, you probably heard about the famous Schrodinger cat that is neither dead nor alive in a box until you look at it. Um, so there are certain quantum phenomena uh, like quantum interference, which only manifests itself when nobody's looking, where there is no external measurement, where this phenomenon is just confined, it's completely isolated. So, so this is again, intuition so it tells you that quantum, the most interesting quantum phenomena happen when nobody's looking. We are going to use it for crypto because that we want to actually um, find a quantum phenomena that tells us that someone is looking. More than that, we want to also use this phenomenon to quantify how much that external entity may know about our secrets. So uh, we're going to use entanglement again. So I'm adding entanglement to the list of your homework, right? Um, it's uh, well, it's a quantum phenomenon, which is uh, kind of like a correlation, but uh, but a little bit more than that. And historically, um, I'm using this quantum entanglement, but you don't necessarily have to. So if you look at the history of this uh, ideas, the the, um, the first idea was actually to use the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It came with Stephen Wiesner, who unfortunately he passed away last year, but uh, quite a quite an interesting character. And then uh, two of my colleagues, uh, Charlie Bennett and Gilles Bressard, based the key distribution on the idea of Heisenberg uncertainty principle. Now, independently, I came up with ideas based on entanglement and uh, on Bell inequality. It's it's not that you know it. I'm it's I'm going to talk about uh, the entanglement base not only because it is just my contribution to the field, but also because it leads to device independence and a few other things. So it's it's in a way uh, more interesting or better. Or, I mean, it's not a value judgment again, but but it's it's fair to say that, that this leads us to device independence, uh, we, which we cannot get in, in any other way. So anyway, so so this, uh, we're going to use this and essentially we're going to go and let me just make a, gain a quick sort of uh, historical detour. Uh, to all discussion physicists had about, um, uh, about the, the nature of, uh, of uh, measurement in quantum physics. So for example, if you take polarization, right? So you take a single photon and polarization is an interesting property of a photon in the sense that you can measure polarization, but you have to specify the direction along which you are going to measure. So it's parametrized. You cannot just say measure a polarization, just you have to be more specific. You say, choose a direction and measure polarization along this particular direction. So, um, so then um, any measurement, uh, gets you a, a binary outcome, plus one or minus one, which you can relabel as zero or one if you want, but um, but you get uh, physicists usually use plus one or minus one because it's easy to assign this num number. So so there is, so we can use, for example, a polarization of light for key distribution. And then the, the interesting thing is that this polarization may not always exist in a sense prior to the measurement. And this is something that, so for example, that, that was something that was uh, observed by Einstein, Podolsky and Rosen in the famous paper in 1935. So Einstein was so much, um, maybe I shouldn't say confused, but unhappy about the state of quantum physics where you can make only and probabilistic um, predictions, statistical predictions, without uh, saying how things happen. And he thought that's not possible, that you know, God doesn't play dice in this case. So it's, it's just phenomenological. So Einstein was trying all possible ways to show that this actually makes little sense. And, and in doing this, so he came up with this paper where he showed 
well, you can generate pairs of particles. Uh, he didn't use polarization, but um, in his original paper, it was a position and momentum. But the, the idea was essentially that if you take quantum physics seriously, you can generate uh, pairs of objects that do not have certain properties. Because if you try to assign numerical values to those properties, you 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 know this kind of doesn't work. So this Einstein used as an argument against quantum physics. He said, "Okay, it's crazy." And uh, in this paper, and this is actually was important to me because uh, he wanted to describe something, define something, what, when something exists, what does it mean to have an element of physical reality? So, and he defines it this way. If without any way disturbing a system, we can predict with certainty a value of a physical quantity, then there exists an element of physical reality corresponding to this physical quantity, right? Um, so this to me was like a definition of eavesdropping. So that's exactly what an eavesdropping wants to do, just to measure, find out the value of the physical quantity uh, without disturbing the system, because then you, an eavesdropper can fool Alice and Bob that uh, this delivery was in fact uh, not uh, eavesdropped, not intercepted, not messed up. And, and it was known also to physics community at the time when I was looking to this, that there are systems uh, where this uh, is indeed the case that you cannot attribute values to, um, to certain observables. Uh, so that there were experiments, in fact, uh, the way it was shown that photons cannot have predetermined values of polarization. Um, so they were based on something that uh, is known today as a Bell inequalities, the whole class of those Bell inequalities. So Bell essentially took Einstein's paper uh, and uh, many years, so like 30 years later or so, um, he said, well, okay, it's not only philosophy, it's a, it's a, it's a testable experimental proposition. I can, I can, you can run an experiment that can refute that this uh, Einstein's worldview. And um, so the Bell inequalities is it's, it's a rather simple thing. Um, I'm just looking at time, but let me just try to give you one slide. Um, or, or maybe I should add it to your homework. Well, yeah, so let me just explain very quickly. So, so, um, so imagine that Alice and Bob uh, receive photons from an external source. Uh, those are entangled photons, but that's a technicality here. Alice is going to choose two directions of polarizations, A1 and A2. Bob is going also to choose uh, direction B1 and direction B2, randomly and independently from each other for each incoming photon. And then they are going to measure polarization along those directions. <clears throat> so for A1, you can get two values, plus one and minus one, the same for A2, the same for B1 and B2. But Alice cannot measure two values of polarizations, either A1, A2, and the same for Bob. So think about A1, A2, B1, B2 as a random variable that has two different outcomes, plus one or minus one. Um, and um, so then you construct another random variable, which we call S. And this simple expression, if you just look at it, you can see that uh, one of the terms in the brackets has to be zero, right? Uh, for each incoming, for each realization, for each instance of this experiment, because uh, B1 and B2, uh, if you look at it, can be either identical or different. So, um, so this term in the bracket is either zero and the other is either plus minus two. So you can see that as long as A1, A2, B1, B2 are uh, have values plus one and minus one, and you can attribute those values to those random variables, then S can only have uh, two values plus one or minus, uh, sorry, plus two or minus two. And uh, so S being plus two and minus two in each experiment, in each instance, so if you run this experiment many, many, many times, so the average value of S uh, that you, you'll find should be somewhere between minus two and two. So this is called the Bell's inequality. From a mathematical point of view, it's just trivial, absolutely trivial, right? Or one, one slide of explanations and you have Bell's inequality. But it's not, uh, from the physicist's point of view, it's not trivial because, because exactly that they cannot uh, be satisfied in some, in some cases. So 
so there are situations where this s goes outside this interval minus two and two. Um, so the more recent take on Bell's inequalities, which is something that I would encourage you probably to look at, is not good, not to go through historical development, but uh, more recently it's just um, analyzed in terms of what is known as CHSH game, a non-local game. Um, let me add it to your to your homework. Okay, so apart from quantum entanglement, look up CHSH non-local game, which is a modern take on Bell's inequality. So you, you'll find it probably easier. You don't have to go to and learn all the historical baggage associated with Bell's inequality. But anyway, so the thing is that you can run this experiment and the quantum mechanical predictions are such that you can go outside uh, this two minus two, two interval. In fact, you can go the absolute value could of this of this figure of merit s can be two square root of two. So well, let's fix it. So then um, that and that was something that uh, that that leads us into interesting situations because that shows that if those Bell's inequalities are violated, that photons do not carry predetermined value of polarization. At least at least not not always. So there are cases they they don't do it. And if you see the violation of Bell inequalities, you are pretty certain that those values were not there because if they were attributed to the polarizations of the photons, then you, would, you wouldn't see the violation of Bell inequalities. So if something is not there, you cannot eavesdrop there. And that is you know, the um, basic intuition behind testing for, uh, testing for eavesdropping. So you make it equivalent for testing for the for violation of Bell inequalities. And you know, at, at least my time, uh, the sort of I knew about some experiments where those uh, inequalities were violated. Probably the most famous one came from France, from Institut d'Optique in Orsay. In 1982, Alain Asper just showed and convinced most physicists that indeed uh, Bell inequalities are violated. So forget about. Uh, so then we have an issue with the reality and attributing values to physical observables and the like. Quite a shocking thing, you know, if you think in classical way. It was a it was a shock wave. I, uh, actually, it wasn't. Sorry, I just I, let me take it back. It should have been a shock wave, but it didn't. It was people were sort of thinking still a bit of a philosophy. So only just uh, um, packaging together with crypto, sort of. And later, I think that the interest in the foundations picked up a little bit because people realize it's not only about our worldview, but it also has. Has applications, so that changed the scene a little bit. So then, you know, the Bell inequality and security. So essentially, if the Bell inequalities are violated, there is uh, no eavesdropping. Uh, but of course, you know, you have to use some mathematical gymnastics to. Uh, and I'm not going to go into details, but you, you know, you have to from the degree of the violation of Bell inequalities, you have to figure out how much. Uh, LA and eavesdrop uh, may know. Uh, we know that if you if you see the extreme violation of the Bell inequalities, um, where this figure of merit S is two square root of two, then then nothing is known to anyone. But uh, but you know the interesting cases, the most difficult cases, are somewhere in between. It's violated, but not quite. Uh, to the extreme, how much how much key can you extract from that? So so that is that requires a, a bit of a mathematical gymnastics, as I said, and, and knowledge of quantum physics. So this goes to your homework, right? <clears throat> so you have to look um, you look at this slide, which shows you how to estimate this min entropy. And uh, I use something here. It's, it's called quantum asymptotic equipartition property for entropy. It's getting more difficult, the homework, but you know, so be it. So after the warm up, then you go into the technical stuff. If you're interested in this stuff, look it up. So then, you know, the the, the status after this was okay, fine. So we can we can have a good key distribution scheme uh, under some assumptions. So so we assume, of course, that Alice and Bob's labs are secure, no information leak, that Alice and Bob control and trust device is in the lab, so they know what they are doing. And we also assume there's a tacit assumption that Alice and Bob have, uh, you can say free will, but what I really mean by that is that they have good random number generators which choose randomly which observable to measure. Remember, we ask them to measure A1, A2, 
in fact, in practical protocols, we also add one extra variable. So, so, so there has to be a random choice for Alice. Should I measure A0, A1, or A2? And make it random, make it secret. And the same for Bob. Um, so that that we assume here, that this seems could be, there was a tacit assumption, but it was, um, should be stated that we assume that they, they, can, they can do it. Now, the question is, uh, is and, and you know all this can be actually nicely demonstrated so in fact uh, once upon a time i was even an experimentalist working with john rarity and paul tapster in something that used to be called uh, defense research agency in Melbourne, uh, where we managed to implement uh, this scheme and show um, that we can really extract the key uh, good fun you know working with an experimentalists especially in the defense establishment where they just simply don't trust uh, you uh, you know they think that you are wasting their time if you are not pointing a laser at the tank or something uh, serious so instead you are trying to test for the bell inequalities um and you know today is our commercial proposition this kind of crypto it's uh, there are many spectacular implementations and uh, so this is a, a big business today um now but there's more to this story, and it's actually, I wish I could see it, but I, I, I couldn't. So it's quite often just um, is the case that your idea is more clever than you. And that was the case of the scheme that I proposed for this key distribution based on entangle and, and violation of bell inequalities. So the colleagues of mine pointed out later that, in fact, you can... I knew that you know you, you don't have to trust the source of the entangled photons, but they said, okay, you can push it even further. You don't have to trust even the devices. So you can even operate on the assumptions that devices that you got came from someone who uh, you don't trust. You just buy it from your enemy. As long as they just respond in a certain way, if you, run the if you can run a statistical test, the Bell test on those devices, they will tell you uh, that they are, you know that they are they are genuine in a sense that they they cannot be forged they have to be sort of based on entangled photons and so in this device independent scenario which is now uh, it's just we also make assumptions that of course alice and bob's labs are secure so no information leaks but we don't have to make assumption that alice and bob control and trust devices they can just get any devices of course you know this is usually a protection against a situation where you design a device and comes from a trusted source, but there are unintentional flaws in the design, which you can never avoid. So, so device independent is, is a cool thing, but, but of course it also means that you can, if you want to buy it from some other unlicensed source and it's as good as a licensed one. So, so under those assumptions, we can now implement uh, key distribution, which is a great progress. And you know, there was a, a long and sort of complicated road of proving security for, for such devices. And it's only recently, in 2019, we got uh, a beautiful proof based on something called entropy accumulation theory, which uh, sort of reduced the general scheme to the previous one Again, a little bit of a technicalities, uh, which I think I'll just give you as uh, as uh, as your homework. So you have to add entropy accumulation theorem. Eat. This is a real challenge. I, I think there was a period of time when this was worked out. So let me just show you the three people who worked it out. Uh, in particular, Rotem, Rotem Arnon Friedman, whom you see, she was a PhD student of Renata Rene, uh, working at Eteha in Zurich um, and I think there was a period of time that only Rotten knew all the details of this proof and it it was it, it's rather complicated but you can look up her PhD thesis uh, from uh, from ETH and um, if you want to go into detail so I'm saying I mean it's now a real challenge not that many people uh, manage to and you know I'm also the guilty one I I I never checked all deltas and epsilon in this proof. So it's a real challenge now, but this is your homework, right? It's getting more interesting. So finally, I have to say that uh, what was a, a great for me was to see this uh, scheme nicely implemented. So a paper came out in Nature a few weeks ago from the Oxford group uh, where they implemented the device independent key distribution. 
So it's kind of, you know, that's a proof that it's not true that nothing changes in Oxford. Uh, from 1991, the first idea to 2021, yeah, something has changed. We proved that uh, you can implement the ideas uh, 30 years later. And uh, so now this, I should end this. Uh, the question is, uh, is it the end of the story? Can we do better than that? Well, you know, you can do better. You can think about problems related to this uh, random number generators that I mentioned, that you need a perfect randomness, local randomness for running the whole scheme. Uh, so we would like to take the last assumption and, and weaken it somehow so that uh, can we do something about it? Uh, so maybe I speculated a little bit about it in my paper with Renato Renato. So those of you who want to read more about it, so here's one review in nature that you can find. But otherwise, I just add it to your homework, right? So can we do devising the dependent quantum key distribution with partially secret randomness? So this is, you know, at this point, you start a research in this field. So which I hope some of you can do. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Arthur. Okay, as usual, let's start with questions from the room before we move to questions from the Zoom. Adam. So maybe I would like uh, to ask uh, a general question. So there is uh, this uh, deep interplay between uh, uh, complexity and uh, computability theory and uh, in fact, the uh, foundations of mathematics in ordinary mathematics. And uh, do you think that uh, this uh, uh, whole business of quantum computing, which uh, shed some a new insight uh, into the foundation of, of mathematics. Yes, so I, you know, just to start with the computational complexity, of course, is an interesting, uh, interesting area, uh, computer science or mathematics, and it's uh, with lots of uh, unsolved problem, right? So, so it's very sort of, um, for me, it's very, it's very, I don't know how should I just put it. I, mean, I feel uneasy about the fact that certain things cannot be proven, like the inherent security of certain problems. And if you look at the complexity classes that people in computational complexity generated, there are many of them, right? Yeah, you start with P, then you have NP, and then you go into randomized computation, and then have you, you, you have uh, uh, BPP, and, and then you look at the memory. So, so there's a zoo of the complexity classes. And when we have so many, that usually means that there's something we don't quite understand. We just do this taxonomy. We classify those problems. And over time, it's, it's getting more complex rather than simplifying them. So if you start simplifying them and reducing one to the other, then you are making a real progress. So um, in general, it's I, I truly believe that um, this uh, the adding quantum computing to this game is very interesting to the foundation, both of mathematics and physics, because it shows that at least when you talk about computer science or about even logic, the interesting question is, is there a physics component to it? Is it really pure abstract mathematics? So to what, it, with, with, we had to define the new complexity classes with quantum computers, right? So roughly we can say for classical deterministic computers based on the deterministic Turing model, we have a set of complexity classes. You add the randomness to this and you know that, well, even in, in sorry, even in classical deterministic computation, you have certain big problems like whether NP is equal P. And uh, quantum computing is not going to resolve this issue, but then you add randomized computation and you have few complexity classes. And there's a big, of course, program in computer science where you can de-randomize algorithms. Can you make those that are based on randomness as, can you make deterministic as good as those randomness? So for a long time, we had few examples, for example, like testing whether a given number is prime or not, in which we had a very fast and efficient randomized algorithm, but not deterministic one, but that has changed. So people found deterministic one. So I think the randomization will may probably succeed 
But then if you add the quantum domain to that, my, my personal belief is that you cannot reduce com quantum complexity classes to the classical ones. So there will be a separation between what you can do on the quantum device and what you can do on classical device. And the funny thing is that, you know, it's not mathematics, but it's kind of physics came into, into this. And, and there are a few more examples which I can give. So, so this is my answer. I'm not sure I really answered your question, whether this is what you meant, but, uh, but the general sort of take on uh, the quantum had a real impact on computational complexity. And in fact, only when it was proven with Charles algorithm that there is, uh, for example, an efficient quantum factoring algorithm, computer scientists and some mathematicians just you know, woke up and said, yeah, it's interesting. So let's look into this. Okay, thank you. And I have also one more question. So this uh, violation of Bell's inequality means that both assumption of realism and uh, locality cannot be simultaneously true. So what is your personal belief that both of them are uh, somehow uh, on existence or only once you yeah, well, realism? It's yeah, it's, it's just, you know, endless debate in the community of physicists. Usually most people assume that you have to just um, take uh, take them both. Uh, it's very difficult to separate uh, in in the argument. It's very difficult to separate uh, locality from reality. So so, um, so there are people who say, okay, we sacrifice reality, and there's some other. Oh no, no, let's sacrifice locality. And it's a question of taste and goes into interpretations of quantum physics. And maybe maybe it's unnecessary because you start thinking about the world in classical terms, whether, whether quantum is the description. So there's no good answer to this question. And if you just go and ask physicists, in fact, funny enough, you mentioned this question. So just a few days ago, I was attending a meeting of uh, people who contributed to this foundations, including Alain Aspect. And there was like debate on your question. It just lasted for a good 15 minutes and there was no conclusion to it. Most people just uh, kind of agreed that we have to sacrifice probably both as a package. So some people even insist saying, um, uh, if they say local realism, they want to put a hyphen there. That's just like a one package, one word, one world view that should be abandoned. But but you know, at the end of the day, you just is a question of understanding. If it comes to understanding, you have to probably make your own judgment. Whatever works, whatever whatever works for your intuition and imagination, as as always with interpretations. Sorry, if I could ask. So, what is your personal belief? All right, what is mine? Well, I just you know, I'm agnostic on this in the sense that I just take the quantum view, and uh, in my view, I'm I'm a realist. So I think that those things are for real and. I take um, the ever at the many world view on quantum physics, where I can see this uh, as a question that is not necessarily well posed in this in this in this language. But you know, that's just me. I'm not going to convert everyone to <laughs> to the ever at interpretation. That was not the purpose of my talk. <laughs> okay, I, I was just curious. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks. Anybody else? Michal, one. No. Okay. I don't see any other questions from the room, so let me look up the Zoom. Hey, anybody from Zoom? Yes. Any questions? Go ahead, Frank. So um, I have a, a few questions. The first one is a historical one. Uh, why didn't you mention Alan Turing? Turing uh, broke the enigma and, and he constructed in Bletchley Park the so-called bombs, actually one of the first computers. So am I wrong with the historical uh, um, question or, or I think uh, Turing is one of the, uh, the code breakers of the enigma? Yeah, so this is... Uh... Yes, yeah, so Alan Turing made contributions, but uh, long before Turing, uh, the Enigma was broken by by the Polish guy. So in uh, 
So what happened is the British, uh, the, the secret of breaking Enigma was passed to uh, the British by the Polish in 1939. So there was a secret meeting where the French and delegation came to Warsaw and the Poles explained to uh, the British how the Enigma is broken. I mean, how can you break? What is the, the method used? So then uh, in Bletchley, when, um, so Bletchley essentially started working and was following the Polish method for a good two or three years until the Enigma was uh, made uh, more complex, few rotors were added where the Polish methods were not uh, used. And by the way, you know, the, the term bomb uh, was uh, actually also came, was invented in fact by the Poles. And I think it was Zygalski who did that. So Turing and his team, not, not only Turing, but his team essentially, the, the, the Bletchley team was essentially working and using the Polish scheme for about for what I know about two years or so, until this complication in the Enigma machine where Turing started making a real contribution and came up with a completely mm -hmm. different mm -hmm. and fresh way of breaking it. So it's not that I want to diminish Turing, uh, on the contrary, I think he made uh, spectacular contributions both to crypto and computer science, but it is uh, it is also fair, and uh, and if you go and see Enigma Museum in Bletchley, so the Bletchley Park, so that's it's you know the credit is given to this early development. Um, I think uh, the a good uh, few early sections are devoted to the Polish method and the Polish mathematicians and how they managed to break, how they passed the secret to the British, how British established their own operations. Um, because you know it was just uh, so funny that that the, the the Brits didn't believe that it's possible to break Enigma. They tried, and, and they, they they were very much surprised that it can be done. So so I think uh, not uh, you know um, Turing, great guy, absolutely a, a genius. Uh, and uh, but in when it comes to quantum credit, sorry, when it comes to uh, breaking Enigma, uh, uh, one has to. Yeah, one has to give a proper credit to Polish cryptographers. Okay, thank you. I didn't know about the Polish one, so that was very, very interesting. Then, mm -hmm. then um, another a little question regarding public keys. So a key, if I understood that correctly, is a private object. So if you have Alice and Bob, and, and only Alice and Bob know the key. What actually is a public key? Um, so yeah, so I didn't explain the public key crypt cryptography. So public key crypto systems have two keys. One is public and one is private. So in order to explain it, perhaps think about um, think about a safe box that has and that has two different keyholes and two different keys. So one for locking the box and the other one for unlocking. And they are two different keys. So if you want to send me a message, you can write something on a piece of paper and put it into this save box and lock the save box with a public key of mine, which is known to everyone. So you know it, so you just simply use a, a locking key, a public key, and you send the, a locked box to me. The thing is that once you lock the box with, your, with a public key of mine, you cannot unlock it with this key. You need a special key, which is called private key, which I have in my pocket and I never share it with anyone. So when this box arrives at my location, I use my private key to unlock the box. So this, so this is a mechanical analogy for, for this mathematical system. Anyone, so for example, you may, if you want people to send secret messages to you, you follow a certain mathematical procedure, you generate two pairs of numbers. One is your public key, one is your private key. Your public key, you announce to the world, everyone knows it. So you can look it up like your telephone number in a telephone directory. And if I want to send to uh, a, a secret message to you, so I write, you know, dear Frank, blah, 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 blah. I put this message into a special algorithm that is using your public key. It's like putting a written message into a box and locking it with a public key. Because it says it's Frank Ortel's public key. 
but nobody knows your private key. You generated it, you keep it secret. So your message arrives to your email box, then you use your private key to decipher it. So this is the way you avoid the key distribution because you say to the world, okay, this is my public key. This number is my public key. Use this algorithm and send messages and they will be protected by mathematics, by computational complexity. I and only I have a private key that will allow me to decrypt those messages. Now, so this sounds like a perfect solution, except there is a problem, right? The, the question is, if people know the algorithm and if people know your public key, can they figure out your private key? And the answer is yes, but it's just difficult. It's you have to solve a complicated mathematical problem, uh, such like factoring, for example. And usually uh, it's so time consuming that uh, even the fastest computers wouldn't be able to do it in reasonable time. Thank you. Thank you. And then, then finally, a, a little comment regarding violation of those inequalities. Um, there are famous papers of uh, Cyrilson about quantum correlation matrices yes. versus classical correlation inverted commas matrices. So that, that it, the statisticians call the cross correlation. And when you are working with the classical cross correlation matrices, then you get uh, the Bell's inequality or the Bell's inequalities, respectively CHS8. And when you are working with the, with the quantum correlation matrices, then you receive two times the square root of two. So take, for example, the Hadamard gate. It's a matrix two by two, one over square root of two. And then the matrix has the entries one, 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 minus one, for example. If you take then the, the um, Hilbert Schmidt norm or the Frobenius norm in, in matrix analysis, then you can get the two times square root of two as a violation of Bell's inequality. And the very interesting thing is that it's deeply related to a very good theorem of Fortenkrieg. It's Fortenkrieg's inequality. And, and uh, maybe you, have, you know about these papers. It's Cyrus, he's famous, famous functionalist. Yes. And, and he wrote several papers on that, uh, on that uh, subject. And he yes. Bell's inequality is the Fortenkrieg's inequality. Yes, so Frank, I didn't. I the, the line is not so good, so I didn't get everything that you said. I know about Cyrilson's work, is, is, this is what you're saying, and and he's um, that Cyrilson bound in particular, where he showed that because you know it is an open question how if you see at the violation of the Bell inequalities, how far can you go? Uh, is two square of two the max, or can we go further? Yes. And uh, so Cyrilson showed that within quantum physics, this is the best you can get. Uh, when you go to, when you relax assumptions and say, okay, well, what about non-signaling correlations? Then you can go a little bit further in this, uh, to, to actually all the way to four and so on. So I, I'm aware of Cyrilson's work and on all some of his mathematical is, is, is a great contribution. Yes, I, I simply didn't need it to explain this in my talk, but, uh, but thank you for your comment. Okay, thank you for allowing me to ask these questions. Thank you. Okay, anybody else? Well, I see no volunteers, so let me make a very important question, Arthur. When is the homework due? You gave us Where's some homework. What? When, when is it due? Where's oh, it the homework. <laughs> you know, I don't, I don't like coercion in any way. So at <laughs> your leisure, you know, you just continue and, uh, and you can distribute those slides among the participants. You have my slides. So I'm, yeah, I'm quite happy. But if you, you know, if you guys do the homework and discover something new, interesting, just let me know. Okay. Okay. We will. Um, I have one a very uh, slight comment. Uh, about this first type of encryption, the most naive one. Um, I remember it from the writings of Edgar Allan Poe, who is one of my favorite authors. Uh, in one of his writings, it was precisely an explanation where the E is the most common letter in English. 
and he was in one of his uh, I don't know short stories explaining how to decipher it. So uh, I, I actually I know this cryptography issue from Edgar Allan Poe, and I thought, yeah, that's what there was a beautiful short story, right? Called I think it was called the Golden Back or something yeah. like. That. But it was it was yeah. He has a very nice explanation. He also he was an amateur cryptographer and. Um, he is the one who's credited with this famous sentence that uh, there's no, uh, I'm, I'm paraphrasing, yeah, I yeah. don't remember exactly, that there's no cipher that human ingenuity can create that human ingenuity cannot break. Yeah, yeah. But now you seem to be close to contradicting this statement. Yeah, you know, Alan Poe, Edgar Allan Poe is also one of my favorites. So I, it's, yeah. good, it's good to contradict authorities every now and then, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so I think uh, we should thank Arthur again for his very, very beautiful talk. Thank you. And uh, we, we keep you at your promise that next time you'll make it in person. I'll do my best, I promise. Okay. <laughs> so I stop recording, but please don't go away. I yes. stop recording.